if you're going to entitle a message, then today I would probably entitle this one, Your First Day in Hell. Your First Day in Hell. Now, buddy, that's a sobering thought. But you know what? There's people that's going to meet that today. There will be people in the next second or two that's going to begin eternity and it'll be their first day in hell. Let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 16 starting in verse 22. We'll do the first part of 23. It says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. I'm glad as a child of God that when we face death, we just slide through it. And we have someone to usher us in to where we're going to be at. It says, The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your precious word. God, I thank you for the scriptures that we're going over today. And I thank you, Father, that you burned this within my heart. I don't know if there's anyone here in this congregation that's not ready to meet you or not. And God, if they all are, then I don't know who may be on the airways listening that's not. But I can promise you this by the authority of God's word. Your word not going to come back void. So someone needed to hear this or you wouldn't have placed this on my heart. And because of that, I'm grieved this morning because I don't want anyone. No one to have to have their first day in hell. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will move in now and take over my vessel. God, speak the words through my lips of what you want people to hear and understand. And God, I pray that you'll give us results for the message that will be preached today. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done so far. I thank you for this great attendance. I thank you for these people and the love they have. pray you'll comfort the people that need comforting. Heal the people that need healing so that they can be back in the church again and fellowshipping with us. We pray, Father, for the next week. We pray as the people start to come back that has been here before. We pray we have a good time of fellowship and people will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. That phrase right there just sticks into my mind. In hell, he lifted up his eyes. <clears throat> Can you imagine? You're going down the road or maybe you're just watching TV. And you blink your eyes, and the next thing you notice is you're in hell. You've heard the last message you'd ever hear. You've heard the last time that the Holy Spirit would come and say, Come on, before it's too late. Come, before it's too late. That will be the last time that you'd have to say, Well, that preacher preaches so long. I wish he'd just shut up so I can go on out to eat. I promise you, if you woke up in the next second in hell, you would be willing to sit here and listen to the Word of God for a hundred days and it not bother you. Because you'd realize the seriousness of the message. As a matter of fact, when we're talking about hell, uh, you'll find out one thing for certain. In America today and all around the world, we have atheists, we have unbelievers, we have agnostics, that don't believe when it, don't know whether there's a God or not. I can tell you one second after death of an unbeliever, there'll be no more atheists. There'll be no more agnostics. You will know for a, beyond a shadow of doubt that there was a God and that there's a little place called hell and that you have spurned your last opportunity to be able to repent and go uh, be able to get away from that place and go to heaven. <coughs> So I can promise you in hell, you don't have to worry about an atheist being there saying there is no God. There is a God and in there, everyone believes him. The Bible uses various Hebrew and Greek words which translate into our English word hell. But when Jesus talked about hell, he referred hell as Gehenna. That was the place of the fire. That was the place of the torment. And that's where it talked about where the angels and the devil and his angels go. Christ spoke, a matter of fact, and you've heard this a million times, I'm sure, but Christ spoke more about hell than he did heaven. Evidently, Christ understood what it was like. Christ understood the seriousness that was in it was involved here. As a matter of fact, when he talked about heaven, he talked about heaven in the 
strongest forms and vernacular that you could ever imagine. He wanted to make sure that it was clear that hell existed. If Jesus Christ wants to make sure that you understand that there is a place called hell, let me just give you fair warning. You better take heed to that, especially since he's talking about that place more than he is the place that he's preparing for the saints of God. He wanted you to know that it is a literal place. It's not a metaphorical. It's not just a thought. It's not just an imagination. It's not just some kind of story. But it's a literal place called hell. Right. According to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, it says that it's not been placed for mankind. It says it's prepared for the devil and his angels. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Not one time do you see where God is rejoicing or Jesus Christ is rejoicing sending anybody to hell. I hear people when you're going down the street all the time, they'll, they'll sit there and say, well, how can a loving God send a person to hell? Especially a person who's been good all their life. God doesn't send anybody to hell. That's your personal choice. God bankrupt heaven to keep anyone from going to hell. And he says over and over and over in the scripture that it's not his will that anyone go there. He said right there in Matthew chapter 25, he prepared it for the devil and his angels. It wasn't a place meant for mankind, but man chose a road that would carry him to hell all the way from the garden. God's plan, God's idea for mankind was to be in the garden of perfection. You didn't have to worry about the rains and storms. You didn't have to worry about the animals. You didn't have to worry about working yourself to death. All you had to do was tend to the garden a little bit. And even at that, you didn't have to worry about snake bites. You didn't have to worry about ticks. You didn't have to worry about heat stroke. None of that. That's what God intended for man. But man wanted more than that. Man wanted to be like God. That was Satan's problem, remember? And Satan said, I'll be like God. I'm the one that's going to rise up. Buddy, man gets himself in trouble when he begins to put on the form of a God. What we need to do is quit worrying about being like God and start doing what God tells us to do. Amen. If we'll do that, then we'll see the power of God fall. Right. And we won't live under curses and we'll be able to have probably better help. I believe a lot of our health problems come because of disobedience and sin. Amen. Not all of them. But I believe some of them does. When God dealt with you and dealt with you and dealt with you, you kept saying, I'll do it my way. Well, Elvis said he did it his way too, and he died. That's cold, but it? that's the truth. You do it your way, you're going to face a death. There's going to be something that comes across that we got to do it God's way. And not regardless of what the secular world and man, if you look at Facebook, some of these so-called entertainers and what they're doing on performances shouldn't make a, a sailor blush. All through Facebook you see that Miley Cyrus and she's half naked. And I don't know if it's true or not, but she keeps saying she's wanting to do a concert in the total nude. The Bible warned that there'd be a time coming forth in the last days where women won't even blush. Buddy, we see that today. A matter of fact, you'll hear some women tell more dirtier jokes than men and cuss like a sailor. Don't bother a bit. But that shows how far we've gotten away from God. But hell never was intended for mankind. It's not a party place. The late Bon Scott once squealed out, listen to this, hell ain't a bad place to be. Must not have read his Bible. He finished that statement by saying, and it ain't a bad place to write a song about either. Sad. There's a song that every time it's played on the radio, I cut it off because it will bury into your mind. You won't be able to get out of your mind. This is what it says. It's the lyrics of the highway to hell. It says, living easy, loving free, season ticket on a one-way ride. Can I tell you? Stop right there. Hell don't have to be a one way ride. Amen. You can be going down life's road, heading towards hell, but Christ has made a detour that you can take another road. It don't have to be a one way ride straight to hell anymore.
Christ made sure that there is a road to heaven too. The Bible said there are few that find it. It said, ask me nothing. Leave me be talking everything in my stride. Don't need a reason. Don't need rhyme. Ain't nothing I'd rather do. Going down party time. My friends are going to be there too. Yeah. No stop sign, speed limit. Nobody's going to slow me down. Like a wheel going to spin me. Nobody's going to mess me around. Hey, Satan, paying my dues. Hear what he's saying? Paying my dues, Satan. Playing in a rock and roll band. Hey, Mama, look at me. I'm on my way to the promised land. Why? If that mother was a God true and loving mama, and he said, Mama, look at me, I'm sure she busted in tears. And think, son, that's not the promise. That's the promise to those that don't trust Jesus Christ. The promise is, is you will go to heaven. But it's not the promised land. It's a different place. Satan will try to deceive you. Then he starts on the course that you won't ever get out of your mind when you listen to it. I'm on a highway to hell. Highway to hell. I'm on a highway to hell. Highway to hell. Mm, don't stop me. Woo. That's sad. Boasting about on a highway to hell. Boasting about his friends going to be there. That's the difference between a saved person and a lost. I've got people who I'm sure think that I'm their moral enemy. They probably hate my guts. And some of them have done some pretty terrible things towards me. But can I tell you, I still don't want them to go to hell. But if, if you've got friends, and you're talking about partying now, and you want them to go with you to hell, but you need to really perk up. Then slayers, hell's awake, literally, detail Satan and other demonic imagery. In his song, that song also uh, introduces, features the phrase, join us, listen. The type of music you listen to is important. The song introduced also features the phrase, join us, repeated as it plays in reverse. Hidden messages is placed within the songs. They did a study one time about music. You think music don't affect you. Matter of fact, when you go back and you study about the devil and his position when he is heaven, uh, most likely he was a choir director. Now, I play both parts. That don't mean I'm the devil, folks, because I have a choir, choir leadership position. But he was in music. He loved music. Some, some uh, different theologians said that when he walked, music would go through. Music plays an important part, let me tell you how. They did a study. They had three different plants, and all of them was planted at the same time, same quality seeds, same soil, same air conditions, same settings, the whole works. They put one plant with no music at all. They put another plant with rock and roll. They put another plant with classical. They come back and checked on the plant, the one that had nothing was growing normal. And the one that had classical was growing a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger. Now my sister would disagree with that. She hates classical music. But I like it. It's, it's, it's soothing to me, refreshing. And they said, but the one that had rock and roll, it was growing away from the speaker. So they thought it might have been an abnormality in the plant. So they turn the plant back around toward the speaker. They come back and check. The first plant that had nothing was the same. It was growing normal. The one with classic was still growing bigger and stronger. The one that had the rock and roll had turned again away from the speaker. They turned the plant back around. They did the study again. The one that had nothing, the plant was growing normal. The one with classic had gotten even bigger and even stronger. And the one with rock and roll died. It affects you, my friend. 
They did another study. They took a German Shepherd dog and they would play music while that dog would eat. Every time the dog would eat, it's the only time you heard music. Every time that dog would eat, they'd put music on. And they kept doing this for a year or two. And it got to the point, the test was, is what's going to happen when we put the music on and have no dog food? So they put the music on. The shepherd went straight to the feeding bowl, began to move his mouth as if he was eating. There was nothing in the bowl. And his digestive system was kicking in. You say, that's foolish. No, it's not. Matter of fact, rock and roll people will tell you that there's a certain beat and there's a certain note that they can play that stimulizes your body. That's why there's a lot of moving and a grooving on the dance floor. They know what that is. And it's scientifically proven that you can affect people that way. Another thing that to show you how powerful music is, is just like me personally, my mind is so short I can't remember even Amazing Grace. But there's some of them old songs with lyrics in it that I don't even know. That I could probably tell you everything it says. Because it's a hypnotic state. It's a hypnotic trance and it plays it. You ever notice when you were out in the world and you, you were listening to that kind of music and you may not have even been paying attention to the word, words, you were just going down feeling the beat and then later that evening you started saying the song because it had slipped into your mind. That beat had a way where it gets into your mind so it's a very good place. But I want you to notice that it's not a place for fun. The rock people are out of their mind. They've been deceived by the devil. First point I want you to notice is you'll see that it's a place of torment. Luke 16, 23, part A. says in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in, now listen to the word, not torment. Torments. Plural. So it's not just that he's in one place where there's one thing going on. It's a plural things going on. He's having torments. This was his first day in hell. He opened up his eyes and all of a sudden he had all these torments that was affecting him at the time. How many ever watched that movie Ghost? You remember the demons coming? <clears throat> Pulling that soul off? I don't think it's that far from it. But it says torments. It's not just one. Matthew 25 verse 41 part 8 you'll see there's plain. It says then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. So your first day in hell, the first thing you're going to experience is an extreme flame. And that flame will never, ever, ever go out. I know as a young boy, one time you had, we had an electric stove and still got them. They've got the little metal wire things that goes across and when they cool down, they turn back to its natural state color, a dark gray, black cup. I had forgotten that mom had cooked on that. And I was small and had a recycle of cabinet, so I laid my hand on that and lifted up. And I had three ring marks that stayed on my hand for months. And for a week or two, it hurt like crazy. That was just a moment of a light heat. Can you imagine being in a fervent heat and flames for eternity with no way out? Well, if you're not saved, you're going to experience that on the very first day when you get to heaven. Or to heaven. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars to have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Believers don't have to go through the second death, aren't you glad? Amen. Matthew chapter 13, 50, second part of that says, And there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Wailing and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> so we got flame that's going, and there's wailing, there's a cry. It's so bad that the teeth are ripping. And this is something you're not going to experience just on your first day. You're going to experience it throughout eternity. Always wanting it to quit, but they'll never stop. That is the cost of sin, my 
friend. That is a cost of man's failure in the garden. But that's what Christ went through all the pain and suffering for is so that you don't have to endure that. He took that wrath that God has on this situation so that you don't have to. So there again, if you find yourself in the next second in hell and you start your first day in hell, you went against God. You went against Jesus' will. As far as I'm concerned, you went against this church's will. We're doing our best trying to keep you from going. They're also going to be total darkness. The little guy sitting there making that song, and all my friends are going with me, it won't do no good. You're not going to see them. It's not going to be a party club there. It's not going to have a bar set up. It's not going to have a good, good, good old time. You're not going to be reminiscing the good old songs you sung. And buddy, I grant you the word that that songwriter wrote when he said, just pay him my dues, Satan. They're going to haunt him for eternity. You're paying your dues. You're paying your dues. You're paying your dues. Christ came to pay your dues. But you said you'd pay your dues. And that's what you're doing. Throughout eternity. So there'll be darkness. Matthew chapter 8 verse 12 part 8. said that the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. The Bible also says it's the bottomless pit. Where you'll be falling in eternity. We can get the idea that we're just stationary. You're just stationary in hell. But it's a bottomless pit. So you're constantly falling in darkness. You're constantly in this flame, this fire, this torment, this agonizing pain. You want to know how bad fire hurts? Go to Grady's Burn Center and visit someone one day. You'll hear them screaming all the time. Because every day they have to scrub that area that's been burnt. And open up that womb again and then put the medicine on it to keep it from infecting. But it's not worth going to hell no matter what you're enjoying right now. It's not worth it. But can you imagine going through all that pain, all that problem, you're going down into hell and you're bumping into one another? All that pain, all that anguish you've got. And the next thing you feel is someone hit your pain. But you're hitting theirs at the same time. And all you hear is screams and porn in darkness. Sound like a place anyone wants to go. What about that party city they're talking about now? What about that highway to hell now? What about the Brand Junction Park? I gave that illustration where that preacher went in one time and there was a bunch of motorcyclists there, big old gang guy, bad dude. Just to sing this red Harley motorcycle. He loved Harley and it was beautiful. Said he went inside that bar and all them bikers turned around and looked at him. He was a preacher. And they were making fun and laughing and stuff and kind of belittling him. And he said, I've got a question. He said, who owns that red party that's sitting out there? The leader of the pack gets up and burly. He said, I do. What's the problem? What do you want? He said, i got a, 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 a statement I want to give you and I hope you take it to heart. He said, what do you want to tell me? Careful what you say. He said, will you do me one favor, please? Don't ride that Harley to hell. Please don't ride that Harley in the hell. Beautiful bike, but please don't ride that Harley to hell. They made fun of him some more, and they, he walked on out the door. They said that he kept preaching for years and years, like 20 or 30 years. Uh, he passed away and said there was a guy that come through the back door and had done the age something. Wanted to know where that preacher was. They said, well, we're sorry, but he's passed away. So is there anything we can help you with? He said, I just wanted to come and tell him thank you for coming to a bar one day. He said, tell me, please don't ride that Harley to hell. He said, oh, I make fun of it. We all make fun of it. But every night when I'd lie in the bed, I'd hear them words. Don't ride that Harley to hell. Don't all ride that Harley to hell. And he said, I just wanted to let him know. Thank God I got saved one day. God called me into the ministry. I'm riding that Harley telling people about Jesus. But if that's what you need to do, that's where you want to go. You want to change your ways. You don't want to be heading towards hell. Then the second point of there'll be no more mercy for you. No more mercy. Luke chapter 16, verses 24 through 25. 
And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Said Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth the good things, and likewise glad with evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou are tormented. How many times have you witnessed to somebody? They say, oh, preacher, I'll get saved once I get through having my fun. I'll get saved when I finally get to the point where I don't want to do the things that I'm doing, that I'm enjoying. Right now. I'll get saved then. You better enjoy it. Because if you die without Christ, that's the last thing you're going to have. That's the last time that you're going to be able to enjoy anything. But he's crying out for mercy. You're sitting here today and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. You can cry to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on me. And he'll save your soul. He'll keep you from going to hell. He'll got a place he's already starting to prepare for you. And when you get there, you can't imagine what it's going to look like. You'll have no more sickness. You'll have no more pain. You'll be walking on the things some of y'all got around your finger and paid a fortune for. A little bit of gold. It's going to be pure gold to where you're walking down. It ain't that fake looking gold color. It's pure like glass. You're walking on the purest gold forever. You talk about beautiful, pure water. There's a, there's a river that flows through there. There's some sight that you're going to see that you've never seen before. You're almost going back to the Garden of Eden. But that's for those that have decided to make their way and ask God to have mercy on, on this side. But if you were to sit right here and you're not accepting the Lord Jesus Christ if it were me, buddy, I wouldn't wait till the end of this message. I'd be running down to this altar to God's sake. Because the very next second, the very next second, you could be in this place, you could be in that torment so bad to where all he wanted was just a dip of water. Just a moment, just a second of some kind of satisfaction. There'll be no more mercy. There'll be no more saving. There'll be no more, uh, Lord, I'm sorry, it's too bad. It's over. You won't have any more mercy. When it comes to that part. Then the last part, the next thing I want you to notice is you'll be eternally separated from God. The torment, the flames, all the different darkness and the agony that's going on, that's going to fail to compare. Fail to compare not being in the presence of God. You think this world's evil now? What's going on in this world right now when a, when a, when a, a man will take a child and, and rape that poor little baby even at two years old? You think it's worth bad now when a person were to take someone and make them a sex trafficker and beat and, and slap on them for the rest, the rest of their life? You think that's bad? You think it's bad that there are people like Dahmer who went around and killed people and ate them? You think that's bad? Nothing to compare when the Spirit of God leaves us behind. It's the Spirit of God, it's God's presence that keeps things in somewhat of an order, whether they're saved or lost. It's got boundaries that set, but in hell, there's no more presence. You can have a little bit of joy in life and still be lost, but it's because of God and His presence that you have joy. But in hell, you're going to be eternally separated from God. Look at the Leviticus chapter 16, verse 26. He said, And beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. For all of my Catholic friends, save your money. You say, what are you talking about? Because they believe that once a loved one's passed, that they can go to the priest and offer a little bit of money, and God would get it, or the baby, the priest would stand on their behalf and pull them back out of hell. That ain't going to happen, my friend. There's not enough money in the world that can buy your soul out of hell. There was only one Christ that would buy your soul out of hell, and it was the Son of God and His precious blood. That's the only Christ that would get you out of hell. You can't buy your way out. 
You can't wish your way out. You can't say it. You can't say you're sorry. You can't say it. Enough hell marriage to get you out of hell when you've taken your first day in hell. That first day in hell will seal your fate forever. So you can't go from one place to another. No, she could see. Now there's darkness all around him. He can't see what's right next to him. But part of that tragedy is you're going to be able to see God's presence. You're going to be able to see the saints enjoying life. And you're going to be in total darkness. What in life is worth all that? What in life is keeping you from coming and asking the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart? What is so valuable that you're willing to take that chance of the next moment being in hell for your first day? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And the flaming fire takes vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. While we're talking about the presence of the Lord, let me just throw this in. Like I said, I hear people all the time saying, oh, I'm having too much fun, preacher. I, I want to do this. I'm young. I got my whole life ahead of me. Don't be foolish. You're young. That's true. you got your whole life ahead of you. That's true. But give it to God and do something that's worthwhile. Give it to God and let God change other lives as well as yours. And by doing that, you think you're having fun now. You get in the center of God's will. You will never have any more joy, more peace, more comfort than anything else you could ever have. You could be broke living on the side of the road and have nothing. But if you've got Jesus Christ in your heart and you're centered in Him and He's in you, you're going to rejoice and you'll thank God. Look at Paul and Silas. They was in the inner prison. But because they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior, they knew who He was. They were in His presence. Here they were in chains. They were locked down. They had been beaten. But they're still singing the glory of God telling them about how good God is. Buddy, when you get in the center of God's will as a Christian, you'll be a joyful person. Right. Yeah. You yeah. say, I don't feel that way. Then get in His center. Right. You're away from Him. You're doing something He's asked you not to do. You've done something in your life. Because when you get in the center, there's joy, unspeakable joy. Yeah. Yeah. It'll overflow. There's not anything in life that's so good in order to keep you going to heaven. Last things, God will not hear any more prayers. Luke 16, 27 through 31 says, He said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Listen to this. And he said, no, no. Father Abraham, but if one, well, let me, let's finish that. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. And here's, listen to this. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. People a lot of times they'll say, well, if God would just show them that He's real. I've just preached you a message. Just tell them about the realness of God. That's told you about the price that must be paid for a soul. And that Jesus Christ came to pay that price. And if you don't accept that as your Savior and as that price and repent, then you will make the penalty of payment, which was already discussed in here with all the torments of the pain, the darkness, the agony, the separation from God. That is the choice that you will make. Yeah, but I want to I see a sign. I want to see a miracle. You read the pages of this book, you come out and listen to Revelation and see how this book is like the front page of the newspaper. You're going to see a sign that this book is true. And according to what he said right there, this is your sign. Preacher has preached to you the gospel. 
He's done his part. God has done his part. He will not have to stand in heaven and say, I'm sorry I didn't give you the opportunity. He's given you the opportunity right now. And what can be spoken to you this morning has been spoken through the Holy Spirit. It is as if God himself, through my lips, has been speaking to you, telling you, don't go there. Stay away. Right. Because your first day in hell is going to be your last day to do anything about it. Amen. Let's go ahead and our head, close our eyes. Y'all go ahead and stand with you. Musicians to come and play them. Like I said, I, I feel in my heart, probably everybody in here is saved. But only you know that. You may have been living a lie all your life. You may realize even in this message that I don't have the joy of the Lord, but if you don't have the joy of the Lord, something's wrong. You either got a fellowship with God or you're not truly saved. But the good thing about it is you're not spending your first day in hell this morning. You can ask God for mercy and God will save your son through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the blood he shed on the cross. So as they play this music, if you feel like that you need to come Oh, Lord, I don't care if you've been a Sunday school teacher. I don't care if you've been a pastor before. Don't let pride stand in your way. I grant you this rich man that sat there and told this story. And this is a true story. This is one that recorded. It's got names. Either. This is one that Jesus Christ was using as an example. I'm so glad that I'm not the example that Jesus Christ used by calling out the name of Roger being in hell. This is a true story, folks. I'm glad I'm not that one. I promise you, old lad, get out of hell right now, even if he had to go back. He proved it. I talk about his brothers. He would be telling everyone, don't go there. Don't spend your days in hell. It's an awful place. Pride is not a place to get in your way. But if you're not saved, I'd make my way to that altar right now. It's as simple as getting down here and asking the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart in your ways. If you're out of fellowship with God, I'd be down in this altar getting it right so that we can continue to win people to the Lord and we can make this place a better place. But I've done all I can do. Now the choice is up to you. You've got one choice. In the next second, should I die, am I going to spend one day in hell, my first day in hell for eternity? I'll be able to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and never have to go to hell. While they play this verse, if you got anything you need to pray about, you come down to this altar and I'll help you pray. If you don't have those, you need to join the church. The church doors are always open. We're going to go ahead and let them play through this course with another verse, of course. No one removes. And we're going to go ahead and be dismissed because you've made your choice. Or to die. You walk out this door. I've done my job. The Holy Spirit's done his job. You won't be able to blame God. You went to hell completely on your own will and your own desire. If by chance you don't want to come down and you want to talk to me first, you can shake my hand when we go out that door. You let me know that you need to talk to me. We'll go in the office and we'll get it straight. But this is not a thing that you need to play around. Those that's watching me on the internet, this could be the last sermon you ever hear. I don't know why you're not in church now. This could be your last sermon. Don't let it pass you by. If you're not saved, it's not worth it. And anyone in hell will tell you that. I told the story one time of a good friend of mine whose brother had killed him. And they were rowdy people. He didn't know Jesus. He was only 16 years old. My friend, that's been almost 50 years ago since that happened. And I think about that every time I preach on that. Boy, name's Craig. And I'm thinking to myself, poor oh, Craig. He was 16 years old when he went and spent his first day in hell. And for 50 years, he's still there. And he'll never, ever, ever. A chance to be born. 16 years old. One decision. 
I won't accept it. You don't know when life's going to call you out. You may feel like you're young, but the graveyard's filled. Even babies, you don't know your time. Best people pray. Go ahead.